Hi, Dr. Romano. I'm very confused on epoxides. I've just been reading different concepts in different books. Do you think you could help me out? Come on over. I prepared something very nice for everybody on epoxides, and i like to go over them with you. Um, the first thing I want to do is to let's look at how to name an epoxide. The first thing I'm going to do when naming an epoxide is to call position number one the oxygen. So this would be position two, so this would be called 2,2-dimethyloxyrane. So the ring itself is oxyrane. Now, the first thing we're going to do is when we're in base, and you can always tell if it's a base if there's no H3O or H plus written. Here, there's just a minus written, and this is the solvent. So in base, the rule is simple. We're going to simply do an SN2 reaction, and we're going to attack that carbon that is least sterically hindered. And that would be this carbon here. So what I would do is I would mentally think, I just cut the molecule like this. The oxygen gets the H and the nucleophile attacks on and adds on OCH3 to this side. So that's pretty straightforward. And of course, because you did an SN2, if this happened to be a chiral carbon, then you would have got the inversion. But here, we don't have to worry about that. Now let's look at the second example. Things have changed. We're now in acid because of the H3O+. You have two different carbons. One carbon on the right side, as you can see, is substituted with two R groups. Here's the rule we're going to bring into the dot. The rule we're going to bring in is the more substituted carbon gets hit by the nucleophile in acid. So since that's the more substituted side, that's the side that breaks, and the O, of course, gets the H, and I add on the nucleophile. So I hope you can see, um, to settle anything, in acid, go to the most substituted side, add the nucleophile. In base, go to the least substituted side, and add the nucleophile. I want to just discuss with you the logic here. This bond here and this bond here are not equal in strength. If you look in the beginning of this bond, if this bond is breaking, and that would put a positive charge on this carbon. And as you can see, it sort of reminds me of a primary like carbocation. Notice the carbocation is not fully formed, but it's beginning to form. And I put a plus charge on this carbon. Whereas if you go to this bond, and you look at the transition state, and that bond is breaking, this carbon is sort of like a tertiary. Now, since the tertiary is more stable, it's more likely to form. So that is reflected in the bond strength. This bond is weaker. So that's a weaker bond. So in other words, that's the bond that's gonna be easier for you to break. So in this medium, you would first protonate, of course, the, the O, and then this is the group that would begin to leave. I use the word SN1-like in acid. It's not a true SN1 for two reasons. One, the carbocation is not fully formed. And secondly, the leaving group begins to leave before the nucleophile attacks. So it's not a true SN1, but it's an SN1-like type of process. Now, if you look go to the book by David Klein or you go to the book by McMurray, you will see that they state that in acid, I want you to go to the less substituted side. Where if you go to Malin Jones textbook, the professor from Princeton, who I've known for many, many years, and Paul Iacanis Bruce or Skip Wade, you will see they tell you the exact opposite. Well, the deal is this. If it was only monosubstituted, like something like this, it can go either way. It would depend on the strength of the nucleophile. It would depend on the solvent. So if there's only one group here, I do concede. I have seen many, many reactions in the literature where it can go either way. So you would have a continuum between SN1, SN2, etc., and both could occur. So in this example, I'm going to have to call this a draw between all the authors. Um, I think I'm going to use the rule 
that Professor Malin Jones, Professor Emeritus at Princeton, he uses, and the rule is in acid, we're going to go to the most substituted side. So sorry, David Klein, I'm not going to agree that, that, that it always works the opposite. Um, it would depend on how substituted the epoxide is. So if there's only one R group, I admit it could go either way. But for the DAT exam, I think it'll be a safe bet that you'll see doubly substituted and it'll be a slam dunk to go to the side that's more substituted in acid. I hope that gives you some idea, but this is sometimes the frustration in organic chemistry that if there's not any substituents, it's a slam dunk for SN2. If there's two substituents, a slam dunk for the SN1. And if there's only one, it's sort of in the middle. Let me show you one final problem that I did for you on the board, and let's see if we could go about solving it. In this example, I give you 2-ethyl-2-methyl-oxyrane. Now, I treat it with a Grignard and then work up with H3O+. Alexandra, do you think we're in acid or base? Acid. Now, let's think about this. That's what most students say, but that's a wrong answer. The acid is not till the second step. The first step is a Grignard, and the Grignard is not only a nucleophile, but it's a powerful base. So what we're going to do, if it's a base, we're going to go to the most substituted side. So there's your two carbons. We have an H here, an H. There's the ethyl. There's the methyl. And as you can see, when I break it, I'm going to break it right here. So I'm going to add the CH3 to here, and this gets the H, and that would be the final product. I hope that gives you some good understanding and insight into the epoxide. I want you to do the ones in the Dat Destroyer. I hit a lot of these type of questions, and I use that rule. The more substituted is where you hit if it's an acid, least substituted go for base. All right, this wraps this up. If you'd like to debate this with me a little bit more, um, I'm always available on the study group on Facebook. All right, good day to you.